Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. First major conversation for today. Um, the Economist uh, put out a report um, over the weekend, which, um, well, I think sometime last week actually, which was uh, very, very shocking uh, with some of the quotes and statements that were made in that report. And um, I'll share with you some of them. It says, when violence erupts, the government does nothing or cracks heads amongst indiscriminately. Nigeria's army is mighty on paper, but many of its soldiers are ghosts who exist only on the payroll, and much of its equipment is stolen and sold to insurgents. That's one of the things that was uh, a part of the uh, uh, quotes from the write-up by The Economist that got a lot of Nigerians talking. Um, it also says the army is also stretched thin, having been deployed to all of Nigeria's states. The police are understaffed, demoralized, and poorly trained. Many supplement, uh, supplement rather their low pay by robbing the public, and they have, uh, rather by robbing the public, they have sworn to protect. Um, another very, very shocking uh, statement on that report. It says money could have come from cutting wasteful spending by the armed forces on uh, fighter jets, which are not of much use for guarding schools. Just examples of some of the things that were made, uh, statements that were made in that report. And I hope that we'll also get to share a little bit more of them with you as we go on with this conversation. This morning, we're speaking with a security expert, Kabir Adamu. Good morning. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Adamu. Good morning, Mr. Okay. The, um, of course, the Army has responded to the Economist report. And, uh, of course, I would always love to share. It says it's one of those deliberate falsehoods and noxious narratives orchestrated by a network of detractors and a coven of dark forces working hard to adjourn, adorn rather, the Nigerian army in an unfitting garb of infamy. It basically also said that the Economist is uh, seemingly sponsored to defame President Muhammadu Buhari. We'll get to the response by the Nigerian army in a bit, but I want you to start with talking about your um, analysis of the Economist uh, report. Okay, um, th thank you. Uh, it's a report that it's coming at a time when, unfortunately, the Nigerian military is challenged. Um, just like the report indicated, it is deployed in increasingly, actually, in internal uh, security uh, matters, um, when, frankly, that is not its primary responsibility. But remarkably, uh, the military has, for some reasons best known to it, taken up that responsibility. And in fact, um, a lot of people in Nigeria see the military as perhaps the only institution, that fabric that has held uh, the country together um, as a result of this overwhelming challenge. In other words, there is a perception that if the military had not come in to uh, in an attempt to address the sec internal security challenges, perhaps this fabric of the country would have collapsed uh, by now because those institutions that have the responsibility for addressing those internal security challenges have not been able to um, so far. Now, um, the report did mention the police too as one of the institutions, and of course it also talked about the in inadequacies within the policing system. So yes, uh, a lot of what the, the report said is reflective of the current situation in Nigeria. However, uh, there were, I would say, missing gaps. Um, efforts that have been made by this administ administration and previous administration to improve the circumstances within the military and the police were not mentioned by that report. And I think um, the ideals of journalism places that responsibility that when you are doing such a report, when you are especially highlighting such um, inadequacies, deficiencies, you should also highlight some of the positive. And I'll quickly mention some of the effort by the, both this government and previous government to improve the military institution. One of them is reforms aimed at improving human rights and the rules of engagement between um, these institutions and the public. So we know, for instance, the military has received extensive training, both internally and in, with foreign partners, in an attempt to improve this human rights record, as well as the rules of engagement. We also know that some structural changes have occurred within these institutions, where they've created departments for interaction between the military and those civil security departments. So you have a civil military coordination unit at the moment within the military. You also have 
instances where infractions by these military officers have been addressed by the military institution. Uh, corruption is an example. Um, we know of a case where a soldier was arrested in Borno State for raping a minor, and that soldier has been sentenced. Uh, we also know of several other cases where uh, several military officers have been caught martial. So those efforts have been made, and I think it would have been very fair for that report to acknowledge and take note of those, those efforts, despite the deficiencies it, it highlighted. Okay, um, so let's also still stay with the deficiencies that's been put out, you know, in the particular report. Now, the, the question would be, with all of the efforts, like you have rightly mentioned, uh, that have been the, the reforms and the training put out, and also with the fact that, yes, we have seen the purchase of Tokano jets, we've also seen that, again, in the proposed uh, 2022 budget, the defense is also going to take a lion's share of 1.4 trillion naira. We're looking at seven, about 7.7%. 7 uh, 7 or thereabout. Uh, how come we still have bandits, Boko Haram, and all of this, you know, on the increase? It feels like there's no match. There seems to be a mismatch with, you know, the funds, all of the efforts put together with, uh, you know, tackling of the insurgents. So the, the reality is that um, I think as a country, we need to differentiate between defense and security. Um, uh, I think as a result of our military legacy, a lot of Nigerians uh, see uh, defense as security, when in reality defense is the component of security. Uh, and I'll quickly explain what I mean. If we have a challenge, like we do have in terrorism, in banditry, and name them, several other challenges, what we do is we deploy uh, personnel with guns, and we think by deploying them, they will be able to address those challenges. Um, no, security encompasses uh, more than that. Security is the whole gamut of protection that requires both this physical, um, you know, forceful deployment, as well as the soft component that would address especially the root causes of those challenges. So yes, we're spending money uh, on, you know, purchase of hardware, but are we addressing those root causes of security, uh, insecurity rather, um, unemployment as an example. And I'm happy yesterday the NLC and I think another labor union highlighted this topic. No matter how we attempt to address insecurity, if we do not tackle unemployment and poverty, then unfortunately uh, it will be very difficult. Even if we buy, you know, 100 super a 100 helicopter gunboats, um, and we employ even 2 million security uh, personnel, if we do not address those root causes, then unfortunately the situation will continue. The other point is corruption. How much of this 2.4 billion, um, a trillion rather, would be dedicated to act the actual um, you know, issues that were highlighted in the budget? What percentage of that would actually go to corrupt? hands. Um, you are living witness to the fact that there was a time when a technocrat in this country suggested that for every 10 kobo budgeted, 8 kobo of that, of that 10 goes to corrupt um, pockets. So it appears maybe only 20% of that money is actually going to, to, to what it was meant for. Now, if that's the case, it means, unfortunately, we are pouring water into a basket. And um, for us to see the effect of this 2.4 billion, we will have to block the leakages through which this money is going. And to do that, we need to introduce and, 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 and strengthen the monitoring and evaluation mechanisms within the entire security architecture that this 2.4 uh, trillion will be going to. If we don't do that, then unfortunately, uh, it would it would be a, a waste. Um, these money will be unfortunately not uh, be deployed for those right direction. The other element is also the civilian oversight over uh, this this um, you know departments in government. Uh, the National Assembly, as an example, and under our current democratic disposition has that responsibility for oversight over the military. So as an example, I'm hoping that this report by The Economist will serve as a basis for these relevant com committees within the National Assembly to oversight 
and ask critical questions regarding some of the allegations within in, in that report. Now, those are the various ways with which the, the, those institutions can live up. I can tell you, unfortunately, that the capacity and capability for that oversight um, at the moment is not uh, adequate. Um, it can be improved upon. Um, not too long ago, you saw what happened in the US when there was a bombing uh, in Afghanistan during the evacuation of um, citizens and then they, they killed citizens. You saw how the Congress immediately set up a committee. And of course, the matter has been you know, decided uh, that the bombing was wrong. And I think compensation is being discussed. So th that kind of oversight also reduces these types of deficiencies and inadequacies within those military. And it reduces the um, possibility of those leakages I, I talked about. 2.4 trillion will be a waste if we do not strengthen these two things that I, I mentioned, unfortunately. Well, uh, Mr. Adamo, I'm sure you also know that we don't have that level of oversight you know, with our National Assembly. Um, that, you know, immediately puts to effect uh, certain, you know, decisions. Um, we would have committees set up, you know, that very, a lot of times don't really lead to, you know, anywhere. But I want to take you back, you know, from what you've said, The Economist report isn't wrong. It's mostly correct. The only challenge is that they didn't include some of the gains that the Nigerian government has also achieved, you know, with its military. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned is corruption, which later on you've also mentioned corruption as a major challenge. Um, even if you in initially said that corruption, you know, is one of the things that they had also tried to fight, you know, with, uh, you know, an arm, a soldier uh, who was caught marshaled for defiling a minor. But the, the economist is pointing out corruption, and I believe, at the topmost level um, and the fraud that exists with the amount of money and billions of naira that are budgeted and are spent, you know, that don't seem to be achieving much. And so I want you to speak once again on corruption um, and you know, how much of a, of a damage it is causing to the fight against um, insurgency and, and insecurity? Um, a lot. Uh, there is a direct correlation between corruption and the deficiency of equipment and the morale of soldiers, at, both at the battlefront and in other spheres, uh, the theater of, of operation by the military. Um, so I'll quickly explain what I mean. Um, equipment is usually bought as a function of the requirement. So when you buy fighter jets, um, you are hoping that, that those fighter jets will be used for specific purposes. But then what are, what are the challenges that you have for which you went out to buy those fighter jets? There has been this argument as an example that perhaps instead of fighter jets, because of the nature of the both terrorism and insurgency and banditry that we have in the country, what would have been relevant for us was um, helicopter uh, gunships or other, other types of assets that have the you know, possibility for deployment in this type of um, internal uh, issues of insurrection. Uh, jets, unfortunately, don't have the cap capability for close range of op operations, but yet that's what we went to buy. Now, did we buy because we anticipated another type of security challenge? Or what stopped us, for instance, from buying both the jets and then these types of helicopter gunships? Uh, currently, we have the Super Tucanos, which are also very good for this type of close range and ideal um, you know, uh, operations. Uh, I I internally, uh, 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 like what we have. Um, now, the other element that is also important, uh, like I said, there's a direct correlation. It, Nigeria is one of the few countries that I know in the world where you have an ongoing war, and I know this is debatable, but I, I am of the opinion that we do have a war uh, ongoing in several fronts in Nigeria. Uh, in all the definitions of a war, both the UN and others, I think what we have in Nigeria is qualified as that. But yet our soldiers still move in soft skin vehicles. Yet our soldiers most times don't have the protective gear that they should uh, have when they are in the battlefront. Most of them, frankly, even where they have the balaclava, uh, the balaclava cannot even stop the types of ammunition that is being shot uh, you know, at, at them. And then one of the most ridiculous things, and I'm quoting the chair, of the Senate Committee of the Army, Ali Ndubi, when he said he's been to the war front and he's seen our soldiers without ammunition. Now, I haven't seen that. What I've seen is them having the AK-47 with one magazine. Now, that one magazine has 30 um, bullets around in it. Meanwhile, the enemy that is coming to attack them, most times 
would have two magazines tied together with 60 rounds of ammunition and would also have several other um, cartridges uh, for immediate deployment, even when those 60 uh, finish. Um, he would also have beyond this AK-47. And so all of these are ramifications of the corruption, unfortunately, because corruption is not just financial, it's also systemic. Uh, and, you know, we can also talk about the um, conflict, um, conflict of interest, where, for instance, when you are issued procurement, something as basic as feeding, um, instead of running a system that is transparent, you issue it to your wife or to your girlfriend, or if you are a woman, to your boyfriend or to your, your husband or someone associated with your husband. And at the end of the day, that person does not supply the food that is so he or she is supposed to supply to the soldier in the war front. What kind of systems are in place to check that and, and prevent it? All of these, unfortunately, are happening within these institutions that I mentioned. But let's not forget that these institutions are not alien to the Nigerian society. Whatever is happening in Nigerian society is most likely to be happening uh, within them. Uh, so let's not isolate them. Uh, the kind of reforms that this administration in particular has done, I think, has been far-reaching. Uh, they are, they are currently, there are trials that are ongoing. Um, some of them have been concluded regarding a high-ranking officer that has been found uh, you know, guilty or uh, uh, being suspected of engaging in corruption. You recall the general that was moving money from Sokoto, and his, uh, those that were moving the money for him were arrested. Uh, that trial, if I'm right, is still concluded or is still ongoing. Uh, a former national security advisor is still being tried for several infractions to our procurement rules. So there have been attempts like that. But then my point, and I think we both agree to that, is that more needs to be done. It's, it's not by being pro, um, reactive. We need to be proactive by putting in place m and &E, monitoring and evaluation, as well as audit functions within the institution. The argument would be, no, you cannot because they are security agencies. But other countries have done it. You can institute an internal um, you know, system for monitoring and ev evaluation that would be oversighted by the National Assembly so that there is transparency in all of these processes, that is from recruitment down to even the operations in, in the field. Uh, procurement is one gray area. I have talked about it in the past, and I, I know that is one area that increasingly we're seeing corruption from within those institutions. So monitoring and evaluation, auditing functions would hopefully reduce um, this corruption. Okay, let's also look at another issue, uh, you know, that has been mentioned over time that uh, some quarters have, uh, you know, described the Nigerian military as constantly losing uh, professionalism. Uh, the constant interference of military in civil affairs. We already know that the police is actually created for the purpose of maintaining peace, law and order in a civil society. Uh, so um, how would you describe the particular act and what can be done? So it's a two-way thing. The military doesn't just wake up and, you know, in interfere. They are usually directed to interfere, uh, usually by a presidential pronouncement. Uh, something coming from the presidency could be from the president himself or from any of his uh, aides that has the responsibility for that. Now, in other countries, what happens is that the National Assembly would have some say in that type of deployment. Uh, you know, there should be, most times, there is a criteria, and I know the Constitution provides for that uh, sort of condition before the military is deployed. But because of our military era, uh, it's become a norm. And I can tell you, you know, I've been in circumstances where even governors have kind of supported the deployment of military in their state. Um, there are certain instances where uh, the, the federal government would want to redeploy the military from certain states, uh, perhaps for expediency or because of um, certain requirements that have arisen. But governors would not only object to it, but they will come to Abuja uh, insist, you know, through discussions with several high-ranking individuals, including the president sometimes, and say, do not uh, deploy those people out of our state. If you do, this, these are the consequences. So again, that political um, sort of uh, climate uh, as a result of the legacy of our military past has created this uh, environment where the military is deployed. Um, the second point that I would like to emphasize, which the report by economists has actually also spoken about, is the inadequacies within the police itself. Now, the police, unfortunately, has 
found itself in a situation. Um, some, some of it as a result of its own failures, others as a result of failure by you know, past government and to an extent even the current government. Funding is an example. Uh, inability to correct some of the structural decisions within the police has made the police ineffective and incapable of addressing those, those challenges. And so the military has stepped in to cover that, that gap. But it's a catch-22 situation. And the, the continued deployment of the military means the police will never be you know, in that position where it will take up its responsibility. So that I am an advocate, and I know there is a lot of people who are also advocating that, that we need to draw a line at some point and redeploy the military and to ask the police to take over its responsibility. But to do that, it means the police would have to be strengthened. And I am happy to say this administration, the Buhari administration, has done, done a lot in an attempt to strengthen the police, um, the police act that has been um, passed not too long ago, I think it was in 2019. Uh, then, of course, we've also seen the police trust fund, which would have responsibility for improving training, welfare, and equipment within the police. And then we've also seen recently, especially after the MSAS, the reform process that has been con instituted by the police. So we're hoping that all of these things would um, increase the capacity of the police uh, to take over from the military. But we, there has to be a conscious effort. And like I said, I think we need to draw a line and say, OK, from 2022 or 2023, um, the, this, this is the procedure for deploying the military. And until then, the police must take over uh, the leadership for internal security deployment. But let's not forget, it's not just the responsibility of the police. There are about um, at least 18 to 19 de uh, departments that have responsibility for civil uh, security matters. And each of these departments will have to be strengthened. Um, I'll quickly, for, like, as an example, mention the, the customs and immigration. Border security is their responsibility. And most of the weapons that we have in the country are coming in from across the border. So if those departments are not strengthened, then it means no matter how we attempt to strengthen the police, there will still be those gaps. Um, so it's, it's not just looking at one institution. We have to look at the, nine, the entire security architecture as a whole and strengthen the capacity and capabilities of all the organizations that have responsibility right. for different... Salam. Um, well, uh, sounds really, you know, interesting, you know, your perspective. But I, I want us to now talk about the response from the army. Um, you agree somehow, some way, to a large extent with the economists and what they've stated. Um, it even got to, you know, as Deti is saying that the, you know, the ammunition and some of the arms, you know, are stolen and sold to the insurgents. Um, but I, I want you to look at the response from the army that basically use many words from the dictionary to say that the economist is sponsored to defame President Mohamed Buhari. Do, do, you, do you see that as an army that, under, that understands the gravity of these accusations and knows what you know, needs to be done in order for um, it to actually win the war against insurgency. And also, when an army, you know, sees these things and interprets it as efforts to defame the president, what does that say to you? Um, again, this is the legacy of a military sort of era. Uh, this kind of responses are responses that um, you know, a PR department uh, in an institution will, will throw out. But then the military institution is a well-respected institution. Um, despite, you know, the, I would say, egregious nature of the allegation. And uh, I think the, uh, the response should have been a bit more uh, diplomatic uh, in, in, you know, with regards to, for instance, yes, you can discredit the conclusion and, like I said, uh, point out the fact that the economists did not take into consideration the huge reforms and steps that have been taken. But also, yeah, but, but, but is it? What well, shouldn't it be? Shouldn't it, that be an opportunity for the army to point out these things instead of simply saying that this is meant to defame the president? And and why is that always the response to criticism? Like I said, this is the legacy of our military era. Uh, we, you know, institutions of government quickly come up to, you know, as it were, see uh, accusations or, you know, reports like this as an attempt uh, to 
directly, uh, you know, smear uh, in the person of the president, as it were. But let's remember that the, pre the institution of the president is there because of Nigeria. So that institution is not over and above Nigeria. What has happened is now a well-respected uh, publication actually um, dragging the, the name of our country, Nigeria, to the mud. Now, whether it is correct or not, the responsibility is on the whole institution of government, not just the military, to point out whether that is correct. I would have expected, as an example, given the fact that the economy is an international organization, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs would have had an impute in the response by the, by the military. The, the military of, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is better suited to, to speak the, that language of the, the diplomacy and uh, um, speak to the Committee of Nations in a manner that they will understand. Um, that response, unfortunately, I think is, is um, short on diplomacy. It is very short in terms of responding to the core issues that were raised by the economy. And I'm hoping that there will be a follow-up response that would be more diplomatic, that would address those core issues, and also, more importantly, uh, um, put the responsibility on the economist to make sure that it corrects some of the um, misconceptions that it has created by that, that report. What we've ended up doing is confirming, or rather what the military's response has ended up doing is confirming their accusation allegation that as an institution, it is not accountable to the civilian population by simply condemning that um, you know, publication without necessarily providing an alternative narrative. Um, I'm not an expert in communication, but I know that one of the things you are hoping to do when you are responding is to provide an alternative narrative. You don't just, you know, discredit, but provide uh, the alternative narrative so that that drives the conversation. Um, and I think most Nigerian um, departments of government, unfortunately, do not realize this. Uh, all, all we hear, like you rightly said, is the defensive position, but provide the, the, the alternative narrative so that right. you discredit what was said and you, you steal, as it were, the platform from wherever it is trying to smear you. All right. Um, just seeing that they also have a podcast. Um on The Economist uh, titled State of Emergency Nigeria. I'm going to definitely take a listen to that. Kabir Adamu, thank you very much for your time this morning. Have a very beautiful Monday ahead. We appreciate it. Thank you and have a good week ahead too. You too. All right, uh, stay with us. Uh, Dele Faratimi joins us next, of course, uh, to discuss State of the Nation. And I'm sure that some of these things that we've just spoken about will come up in this conversation coming up next.